say so. Uh, the title is actually How is Climate Changing for Coral Reefs? But uh, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> If you want to snooze for the next half hour, then the answer is fast and likely to get faster. And <laughs> I should say that my mother said once that the weather was never the same once I started looking at climate. That was actually in 1976 when I started looking at climate. And as mothers usually are, she was right. What we've seen in recent decades is an acceleration in the rate of warming, if the climate changes, something that we set in chain over 200 years ago. I want to talk about climate change not being a future event, a little bit about the vulnerability of coral reefs, focus on some of the already observed changes in terms of seawater temperatures, some of the historical perspectives we can get from the coral core archives, and just look at the most recent summer on the Great Barrier Reef as a taste of things to come. If we didn't have that precious atmosphere out there, we wouldn't be here at all. There's a natural greenhouse effect, and without it would be 30 degrees Celsius cooler. We now know that the main greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, is about 40% higher, and crucially, as has already been mentioned, there's about eight times as many people on the planet than there was at the end of the 18th century. The net effect of all these changes in the greenhouse gases is to keep more energy in the system and that's resulting in global warming. Some of the recent evidence is most disconcerting because we're seeing for example that global carbon dioxide emissions are tracking the upper end scenarios. Previously, if I can, this is the sort of more optimistic scenario that the IPCC looked at into the future. This is the most pessimistic 2008 were up there in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. The same seems to be happening with sea level rise. Again, this is going back to 1970. The low end and the high end of the projections from IPCC and all the evidence is that we are tracking the upper end scenarios. There is much evidence, physical, biological, that we're living in a rapidly warming world. One of the most easily, one of the most dramatic is not only the decline in Arctic sea ice, but also the fact that it's thinning. And if you go on the web, you can go on a cruise now through the Northwest Passage where people previously lost their lives in the search for it. Another factor is part of that extra carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere has been absorbed by the oceans. Without that, we'd actually be warmer than we are at this point in time, but that's going to have dramatic consequences by changing the ocean chemistry. I should point out, this is from the Hawaii, sorry, Hawaii Ocean Times series, or HOTS, and there's a paper come out just within the past week from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science that's done an elegant study it also illustrates the importance of having long-term observational records out in the oceans so we can actually detect and understand the changes that are happening. There are a number of areas where a rapidly changing climate is going to affect coral reefs, and we'll be hearing about some of these today. Bleaching diseases, more intense tropical cyclones, ocean acidification, the likelihood of more extreme rainfall and river flood events, which will affect nearshore and potentially mid-shelf reefs more frequently. Changes in ocean circulation patterns, which are a lot, uh, uh, not so well constrained at present. Reduced time intervals between disturbances. That's going to be a key factor. And there are emerging, it's not just going to be direct effects on corals, indirect effects on other reef organisms and also direct effects on the physiology and pro functioning of other organisms. We know coral reefs are highly vulnerable to climate change. We have instrumental evidence for a warming world from observations taken basically of weather through time. What's happening, the top figure shows that the global land sea surface temperatures back to 1870. 
If you look at the long-term trend, it was warming about less than 0.04 Celsius per decade. If we just focus on the recent period, we see an acceleration in that rate of warming. It's now warming about 0.1 degrees Celsius per decade. We are also seeing warming of ocean temperatures in the tropical ocean region. And a useful metric, because global warming tends to be greater at higher latitudes compar compared to low latitudes, which doesn't mean that the tropics are insignificant. The tropical oceans are warming about 70% of the global average rate. That's quite a useful metric because if you see people talking about it could be four degrees average global temperatures rise in the future, 70% of that rate is what you're talking about in terms of warming of the tropical oceans. Again, we have the tropical oceans going back to 1870, and they were warming at about 0 0.04 degrees Celsius per decade. I'll also point out this year here, most of you will be able to guess which that year is, that's 1998, which was the warmest year on record, and we'll come back to that one. The rate of warming in the tropical ocean is also accelerating, and here I've divided it up into average annual water temperatures, the tropical maximum water temperatures, which are particularly significant in terms of cold bleaching, and also the minimum sea surface temperatures each year. And again, these are warming at about 0 0.08 degrees Celsius per decade. It's again accelerated compared to the records going back into the 19th century. And there again, we have that 1998 year. And some people, a few people have suggested that things have been cooling since 1998, so everything's fine. Another way we can look at that, because climate is about averages and contained variability. So what I've done here is change those series into just 10 year averages with the standard deviation. And again, we have tropical annual, maximum, and minimum sea surface temperatures. So actually 1998 falls in this period, this second but last 10 year average. We can see that in each of these series we've consistently seen the most recent 10 year period has been warmer. So there's been this steady ramping up in temperatures and also this is so different from what it was down here back at the end of the 19th century. Average temperatures are progressively getting warmer. There is no doubt about that. There is, however, quite a bit of spatial variation in the magnitude of warming. And this is an example for the tropical Pacific. And we're just looking at the most recent 20 years and comparing that to the average of the 1950s and the 1960s. And this is annual, minimum, and maximum. On the right-hand side, I have marked either in red or blue, where those changes are statistically significant. From a climatological point of view, are those changes in the 20-year mean significant? And there's two things you can see. Firstly, not everywhere's warming. There's a few spots that have been cooling over that period. And not everywhere has that signal of significant warming emerged as a significant event. So there's still quite a little of spatial variability in the observed changes. And I'll come back to that at the end because it's important in terms of some of the models and how well they can capture this variability in the future because this is likely to involve ocean circulation patterns. For example, the sort of greater warming down here is probably due to an acceleration of the East Australian currents, which is probably not as yet well captured in some of the global climate projections. This is just looking at those 10-year averages going round the coastal reef waters of Australia. Again, just to illustrate that we're seeing this warming happening, even at across the top here, where the changes are relatively smaller, the changes are significant. And the greatest changes have probably been seen off the south west coast of Western Australia, where the average temperatures are probably nearly a degree warmer than they were at the end of the 19th century. What's happening with these changes in terms of our coastal waters is that the climate zones are shifting. If 
I'm talking about how I define climate zones as a climatologist, just in terms of sort of the average annual temperatures. Once you start to put those warming patterns onto it, the climate zones have already shifted south with the relatively modest global warming we've seen to date. Along northwestern Australian coasts, they've shifted about 120 odd kilometers. And we've seen greater shifts along the northeastern coast of Australia. What I've actually plotted here is in blue, the percentage of the area along the coast that was falling within particular temperature classes in the 1950s and 60s, and what was happening in the most recent 20 years in orange. And you can see big shifts here along the northeast coast, a big decline here, a big increase in the 24 to 25 degrees Celsius band, and so on. This means that the environmental envelope of organisms out there on the reef have already changed. And there is a lot of other evidence emerging in the scientific li literature about the expansion of the global tropics, both in terms of the atmospheric and oceanic circulation patterns, but also evidence that organisms are on the move. One of the results of this warming baseline temperatures in the tropical oceans, as many people are aware, is the increase in frequency of mass coal bleaching events as a response to thermal stress. And that link is so clear that NOAA monitor the uh, potential for bleaching in near real time. And this bottom, this bottom figure is again just summarizing a metric of the thermal stress to coal reefs. This was for about 50 sites that bleached during 1997, 1998. And we can see that steady ramping up of thermal stress, but also the extreme nature of the 97, 1998 events. This is dividing that into sort of Indian Ocean, Middle East, Pacific Ocean, Southeast Asia, the Caribbean and the Atlantic in the top four panels. And for each of those, we see the extreme nature, the, these three, of the 1998 event, but also the steady ramping up. The Caribbean and Atlantic group of reefs that bleached in 97, 98 is actually interesting because the thermal stress seemed to appear earlier in that area, and I think this is related to the multi-decadal climate oscillations that are affecting the Atlantic Ocean and feeding into the Caribbean. And this bottom picture is for a number of sites that didn't actually bleach in 97, 98, but again, this thermal stress index is indicating that that's increasing through time. One of the expected consequences as we continue in a warming world is there might actually be fewer tropical cyclones, but those that do occur might be more intense. We also know that tropical cyclones affect many of the coral reefs anyway around the world, and they can recover from such events. This is just two be before and after pictures from McDonald Reef in the northern Great Barrier Reef. Fantastic looking reef after tropical cyclone Ingrid went through it looked a right mess, but within that mess is still bits of living coal, and that reef can recover, but it takes time. And that's a key issue with some of the changes that we're seeing in climate, is the reduced interval between disturbances. Sorry, got trigger happy there. And this is just to show, it's coral reefs outside of about 10 degrees of the equator that are affected by tropical cyclones and storms. At present, there's no real indication that the locations of tropical cyclones are going to change. But again, it's still problems with the global climate models in downscaling to something as such as an individual tropical cyclone. There's a little bit of evidence, observational evidence, this is for the Australian region, that maybe there are fewer tropical cyclones, and, but those that do occur are more severe, and if we think about the past few years, we've had tropical cyclone Hamish, tropical cyclone Larry, and several ones off the western coast of Australia. Again, another thing that we're reasonably confident of is that rainfall extremes are going to get more extreme. For reefs of the Great Barrier Reef, the inshore reefs, you know, they're used 
to seeing fresh water, mild, mild fresher water, I should say, each year. But if that gets further out onto the reefs, it's going to be much more of a shock to those who are doing that. Also, even if there was no change in average rainfall, drought events are likely to be more extreme just because the temperatures are higher. We can also put some of these recent changes from the instrumental observations into a longer term context using these wonderful history books out on the reefs. And I just want to give you two or three examples of that. At the simplest level, this is an X-ray positive of showing the annual banding patterns in coral skeletons. This is a coral that in 1998, when there was a thermal temperature anomaly, very warm waters on the Great Barrier Reef, the coral seems to have stopped extending, growing outwards, but it was still sort of packing in some skeleton. It was still calcifying, so it produced this unusual dark band. And then it's recovered and continued growing. This is a coral off uh, in the Western Pacific warm pool of Papua New Guinea. Unusually warm water temperatures where they're growing about two centimeters a year. That's an area which during an El Nino event experiences cooler than normal waters. And what happened in that year was the coral continued extending, but it didn't put so much skeleton down. So it had an unusual low density band. And there's a useful relationship between average water temperatures and the average calcification rates of corals. And this is in terms of big spatial averages and a lot of corals. But it means you can go to a new site or look at recent observations and say, are corals doing what they're supposed to be doing at that water temperature? And a recent study looking at Ames, through Ames large archive of coral pores materials through the Great Barrier Reef showed that there has been a very disturbing decline in calcification rates of parietes on the Great Barrier Reef. And we couldn't say specifically it was due to this or due to that. It is not due to water quality issues in inshore waters, as some people initially suggested. It is most likely due to a combination of increasing water temperatures, increasing temperature stress, and possibly change in ocean chemistry. This is another example where we put, use the corals to put the past to present in perspective. This is a reconstruction that Eric Hendy produced a number of years ago, and I've recalibrated it. This is water temperatures for the Great Barrier Reef, recalibrated to, to the instrumental records that we have here. It's a bit chunky because these are five-year averages, and this is where the future might take us. And that's the optimistic one with a one degree warming by the end of this century. So you can see those are way out of what these corals have experienced over the past few hundred years. Another lovely record that we can get from corals of the Great Barrier Reef tells us about freshwater flood events and these luminescent lines. And this has allowed us to reconstruct the freshwater flow into the Great Barrier Reef back to the early 17th century. And this tells us, for example, that 1974, if some of you remember, 73, 74, wet season. I'm sort of judging people's ages wrongly here, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> we probably would have had water up to here being this close to the river in Brisbane. It was an, uh, an incredible event. And the Federation drought of 1902 was probably the driest in that context. There's also evidence from these corals that the fresh water is getting further out onto the reef, into the mid-shelf reefs which are not used to it. Again, I've recalibrated that into a series that the Bureau of Meteorology produced, which is the Northeastern Australian uh, Summer Wet Season Index, and then just looked at changes through time. Oops. And the top figure shows just for 31 years the median rainfall back to the end of the 17th century. And there's actually not been any change in average rainfall. However, if we look at the variability, the extremes, in terms of the, the percentile range, that has been increasing. So the wet years seem to have been getting wetter and the dry years getting drier, which is one of the projected consequences of the warming climate in this part of the world. The ocean chemistry 
is changing. There is evidence that that's already happening. And it's clear that by moving into this, further into this century, that large parts of the tropical oceans, which are currently hospitable for coral reefs, are not going to be so friendly for coral reefs. This really is a concern. We also want to know how much more tropical oceans will warm. And one of the features, if you remember back to that pattern of warming, observed warming in the tropical Pacific, as yet the models do not capture that complicated patterns of variability which include changes in ocean currents and upwelling of things like that. The other feature is how much can tropical oceans warm. There is some evidence that there is a thermal cap and if we look at these two series, this is just the percentage of the tropical oceans with water temperatures and temperature classes in January and July. And you see a rapid tail off once you get to about 30, 31 degrees Celsius. And that's just showing the peaks. And these are the changes that we've seen between, again, the most recent 20 year periods and the 50s and 60s. We see a large increase here but we're not seeing much changes beyond 31 degrees Celsius. It's unclear from the climate models and it's unclear when you sort of speak to some of the experts in this field, whether this thermal cap is, is real. It, the idea is that large parts of the tropical ocean cannot get above about 31, 32 degrees Celsius because you start to get feedback processes <coughs> that would cool it down. So, it is unclear at present whether this is a moving feast or whether it's a fixed threshold. If we say that it's not a fixed threshold and that it will, there is no thermal cap, then as we go to the end of this century with one degree warming, we're talking about say 20% of the tropical oceans having water temperatures over 32 degrees Celsius. There's evidence emerging from some of the studies that I think you'll be hearing about that there may be critical thresholds in terms of the physiology of certain marine organisms. So this idea of passing thresholds is really quite important. We also need to know how El Nino Southern Oscillation events will change because they have significant impacts on coral reef ecosystems. The top two figures show over the two years of an El Nino Southern Oscillation event areas where you expect the water temperatures to be significantly warmer than normal and areas cooler and the same for the opposite La Nina event. So it's fairly clear that during an El Nino event, the risk of conditions conducive to coral bleaching is much higher throughout the tropical oceans. And during a La Nina event, apart from this area down here, the conditions are less conducive to coral bleaching. ENSO events also produce significant changes in the distribution of tropical cyclones and in rainfall, all of which can impact upon tropical coral reefs, particularly in the Pacific. Around the Australian coast, this is just for El Nino events, and this is of concern because there's indications that we're moving into an El Nino event. Water temperatures in these areas are likely to be significantly warmer than normal during the, the the late summer season. There are not so much significant changes around Australian coral reef environments with La Nina events. The main signals there are in terms of rainfall. Finally, just talk about the taste of things to come, the 2008-2009 summer season. In December, these are the average water temperature anomalies that were observed and people were going, gosh, it's warmer than normal before we go into the summer season. These are two experimental products that are now available. This is from the Bureau of Meteorology. This is from uh, NOAA. Both were forecasting unusually warm conditions as we went into the summer season. And in fact, NOAA converts their predictions of water temperatures actually into bleaching risk forecasts. So there were strong indications that we were going into a bleaching summer. But then it rained and it rained and it rained. And this is a fascinating picture. This just sort of summarizes Australia to me. This is the ground temperature anomaly across Australia the week before the, the Victorian bushfires. Extremely hot here, extremely co relatively cool here. 
And this is what the Burdekin River can look like in the winter. And this is what it looks like in the summer. That, that the bridge here is somewhere in there. That just shows you how much. And just to go back in terms of how unusual was this summer in terms of the wet season, how the corals can put it in perspective. When we looked at that longer term record, it was about the 21st wettest season for Queensland in that 379 year long record. Then we had a tropical cyclone Hamish that meandered down the outside of the reef high category tropical cyclone. So all that acted to reduce and cool the surface waters. So what we ended up with was some low level thermal bleaching in the north where it was still a bit warm. We actually had fresh water bleaching in the central section and in the southern section we had physical impact on the reef due to the tropical cyclone. All those factors are expected to increase with frequency as we continue into a warming world. And that's just one of those lovely big bombies that I like to work with, the tropical cyclone can just toss it up onto the reef flat. The rubble of the staghorn corals and these bright, pretty little pink things are not very nice things because they're seaweed essentially rapidly moving in and recolonizing that area. We know tropical oceans have already significantly warmed. There are spatial patterns in that warming which need to be teased out and improved in these climate models. We need to understand those better. It is the rate of warming that is of real concern. We know tropical climate zones have already shifted. The historical perspectives that we can gain from coral cores support these recent changes and we have disturbing evidence of a recent decline in growth rates of a major reef building species on the Great Barrier Reef. It's unclear how ENSO events will change in the future, but that's really important, not for coral reefs of the Pacific, but throughout the Indo-Pacific. The other point is, we talk about climate change, but it is a change in climate. We, we, it's not simply a move from, oh, this is the average conditions, this is what you've got to get used to now. For the foreseeable future, we are in a changing situation, and we are expecting organisms and ourselves, but we're easy to deal with, to deal with these things on the run. Apart from the obvious, we do need better climate models for the tropical ocean regions, and this is clearly recognized by the modeling, climate modeling community. We need it down at the scale relevant to reef processes. One of the things is we need improved understanding of tropical climate dynamics. One of the ways we can get that is extending the climate records from these wonderful archives and coral cores. High resolution observations at the scale of reef processes. We're starting that in Australia with IMOS, in particular with Bruce, giving us very good. But we also need these longer term time series. The Hawaiian and the Bermuda time series are providing incredibly rich records about how the oceans are changing, not just at the surface, but at depth. We need to understand how ENSO and ocean currents will change. And we also need to understand the implications of this reduced recovery intervals. You might get hit by bleaching one year, you might get hit by a tropical cyclone two years hence, then you might get fresh water. That's the sort of likely scenario. And we seem to have had some evidence of it happening recently. And I'd like to leave you with two eloquent quotes, one from Will Steffen and the other from Pat Panadel. It is a real concern that we are tracking the upper end scenarios here. And all the evidence is out there, as referred to earlier. My mother used to call me constant dripping because I'd go on and on about something. <laughs> and I feel the same <laughs> about this climate change issue. It is real, it is happening, and it is happening faster than expected. And it's an experiment in real time in the real world. Thank you.